this wave in all creation around us. Nothing can pass by your throne of grace.
that I fire down in my soul that I can contain, that I can control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can contain, that I can control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be here in your love, here in your love. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be here in your love, here in your love. Amen. What a blessing, Jesus, that we get to come be here praising you lifting you up and all sometimes the whole world just goes crazy lord you are the chief cornerstone you don't change you're the same yesterday today and forever lord thank you that you're so trustworthy jesus and you are worthy of our whole hearts lord i just pray for this sunday morning not just here in this room but all of madison i just pray that christians would lift you up glorify you Praise your name, Lord, because you're so worthy to be praised. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here that we get to just come and just be in awe of you together, Lord, and that you've promised that where two or three are gathered, you'll be in the midst. So I just praise you for that, Lord, and I thank you for this Sunday morning, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. We'll take a moment and you can say hi to one another.
So why would he fail now? He won't.
eyes to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering. Some imagine you are distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end the proof is in your wound. Yes, in the end the proof is in your wound. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who there's a God who please, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the sons of me. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise. Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing. to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, blood and tears, how can it be, there's a God who there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah, to the sun of suffering, praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah, to the sun of suffering. Lord, thank you for dying on that 
cross for us, Jesus, that you conquered the death of eternity that we should have been given. Lord, we pray that you just teach us now by your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Yes. Do my best Brian imitation. Okay. First things first, where is she? Willa May, is she in here? Well, she's got to, it's her birthday, man. We got to sing to her. She got to make an entrance or something. Amanda, can you tell Willa May we're waiting on her out there? She's coming. Gina, I think we need the trumpet. <laughs> There she is. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Willie Mae. Happy birthday to you. Woohoo! All right. All right. Now we can get on with life, okay? That's first thing. All right, there are multiple Bible studies through the week going on. There's a women's retreat coming up Friday, October 25th through Saturday the 26th. There's a sign-up on the back table. There is a hallelujah night coming up Thursday the 31st. If you've never been here, it's, the sanctuary is just filled up with balloons and candy, and so all your kids will get sugared up and... Have a good time driving them home. That'll be fun. But there's food, games, worship, puppet show, costume contest, and more. You can win a new Lamborghini if you're at the best. <laughs> okay. And our friend Sean Dickers, if you've been here long enough, you may remember Sean and Stephanie. They planted a church in uh, White Bear, Minnesota. John reminded me that's a polar bear. Thank you, John. White Bear. Yeah, duh. <laughs> They call it White Bear in Minnesota, and they are having a um, just a get-together for whoever wants to come, and there's information on the back. It started out as a men's retreat. Now it's just an everybody retreat, and so they're inviting us if you want to come. Uh, we have a, a missionary that we support in India. You'll see his picture up here. His name's David Gerald, and he's been here, and he's spoken in the past. But his father uh, lost, I guess, part of his home or something. So we're doing what we can. If you want to, you know, give towards that, that's between you and the Lord. You would put something in the box there. If you want to give, there's a box in the back. And we can use everything we can get to keep the electricity and everything going. But David Gerald, the special uh, gift, if you want, I can do it online as well. Um, there's a new TV out there, and we gift, and someone gave us that. That was a blessing. But if you're sitting in the dining area, um, there may be some sound issues. They're trying to dial all that in. So if it looks like an old Chinese movie and my lips are moving and then the sound comes, uh, we're trying to get that together, okay? Uh, we are going to have the carpets clean tomorrow. And so uh, can get all the help we can get to move chairs out of the way, tables, that kind of thing afterwards. But there will be food uh, directly after, really good food, and they'll be served up, good fellowship time. Throughout the week, we have uh, midweek on Wednesday where uh, we will be in the book of Exodus. We're going through the Old Testament verse by verse. And we have another midweek on Friday, and we're going through Isaiah and uh, Amos, I think, right? Amos, but uh, this Friday will be Isaiah, and so it's uh, books of prophecy from the Bible because the days we're living in. Today we're in Revelation 16, so uh, it's just coincidental, I think, you know, God knows what he's doing, but there's other Bible studies, all this information is on the table in the front, so if you want to get that, you can get it there. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we know you. God, that you have saved us as we've just been singing, God, all through your grace and your empowerment, Lord, is the only way that we could ever stand before you, Lord, without being draped in filthy rags. 
uh, what we offer is it's just a, a joke, Lord, and we, we try, but Lord, thank you, Jesus, for coming and washing us in your blood and saving us, Lord, by your power. And now you also sustain us and you preserve us and you keep us. And every day, Lord, even though I sin and fall short and fail, Lord, you hold us up by your grace. And you continue to just get us moving next day to the next day. And if you come today, may we be found watching. We love you, Lord, and we just love to serve you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit, who has been sent to teach us, that he would do so today. Teach us out of this chapter here in Revelation that we can know you more and leave knowing you better than when we walked in the door, God. It's our, our desire and our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 16, verse 1, the Apostle John says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their due. Now, there is carved into a building in Washington, D.C. It's pretty amazing. They have scripture carved into the buildings. They obviously realized that as time went on, people would not want that to be there. But in one building is carved a rhetorical question. Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if that nation removes that only firm foundation of those liberties, which is the conviction that liberties are a gift of God. And those liberties cannot be violated without experiencing God's wrath. And I tremble, the quotation goes on, when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Now that is true of nations and what we're seeing here in Revelation is the beginning in chapter 16 of God's final act of just judgment coming upon the earth in the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period, all in preparation of the Lord's return to this earth. The way this final judgment upon the earth was introduced back in chapter 15 was with a vision that John saw of what took place in heaven. Chapter 15, verse 1, he said, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and his mark, and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. So this ceremonial event is what John sees. This is a ceremonial event, and those redeemed saints are standing on this, on this sea of glass, as it's called, now with fire in it. These are the tribulation saints. All who could, could be saved will have, be, will have been saved by this time. And so it's a ceremonial event. He looks in verse 5 of chapter 15, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, just like the back door is here at the beginning. The, the, the heavens are opened, and out of the temple come seven angels, having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen, having their chest girded with golden bands. So seven angels marching out from the throne of God, receiving these bowls of judgment, representing God's wrath that is to be poured out on the earth, divine justice. It's an intangible attribute of God, such as mercy or omniscience or immutability. These are all attributes of God that are intangible. Here, that which is intangible, God's justice, is being shown to be transformed into a tangible physical judgment. And obviously God doesn't take that lightly as it's represented as a solemn event in verse 8, the last verse of chapter 15, the temple was filled with smoke 
from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels was completed. So the inability to enter the temple would represent the end of any opportunity to intercede for someone. There, if the cloud filled the temple in the Old Testament, the high priest could not go in there. There was no ability to intercede for anybody. And that's what's being shown here. This is God's final judgment coming. No one's able to enter. And in the temples, till the seven plagues, it says at the end of verse 8, of the seven angels is complete. And I heard a loud voice, he says in verse 1 of chapter 16, from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Now, since no one's able to enter the heavenly temple, this loud voice, great or powerful is what it means, coming out from heaven, represents the voice of God himself. And so no messenger, no go-between giving this order for the angels to pour out these final bowls of God's wrath. His mercy is being removed once and for all from those remaining on the earth. In the end, God has no other recourse. This is the amazing thing. And you see already the earth becoming so corrupt to the point where you think, could it become worse? Yes, it's going to become even worse to where the whole world is going to be filled. And God has no other recourse than to give an unrepentant world who wants nothing to do with him. Their desire is to have nothing to do with God, and he's going to give them what they want in the end. Before I got saved, I just took God's mercy and his grace for granted every single day. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't give a second thought, is the sun going to come up tomorrow? Never thought about it. I'm just going about my life living the way I want to live. Never thought, man, I hope there's enough rain to replenish the water table so there's plenty of fresh water. I wouldn't even think of those things. All I thought of was, how can I sin? What can I do? What can I do to please myself? Never gave a, a second thought to any of that. I've never had to concern myself with anything within my own body that functions. Just took it for granted. And here this world, a complex mechanism, continues to operate day in, day out as it's supposed to. But the day is going to come where God is going to pull the plug on all of it. So as to move on to ages to come as he has planned and as are taught here in the Bible. So as these angels march out, a very formal, solemn event. The first went and poured out his bowl, verse 2 says, upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, if you've been following along, you know that there was a series of trumpet judgments earlier in the book of Revelation that depicted, you know, judgments that came upon the earth in the first three and a half years of this tribulation period. And there's a parallel between these judgments and those. The first trumpet judgment was upon the land, the second trumpet judgment was upon the sea. The third was upon the fresh water. Those judgments are now taken to their extreme. This first bold judgment is poured out upon the physical land, literally, specifically those who still remain living. A foul, loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These sores, in other words, are going to break out on people's physical bodies. Foul, that word in Greek, it means that they are evil, providing an appropriate description as the foulness within the people remaining on the earth manifests itself externally. Loathsome, it's a word that means painful or distressing, literally. So it's not just physically painful, but it's emotional pain. These sores will come upon those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. There's a direct correlation between those two things, these sores and this mark of the beast. So it's not that God inflicts these sores upon people. In chapter 14, God warned the people of earth through a, an angelic messenger, don't receive the mark of the beast, which will be an act of worship for those who do, will drink the full wrath of God's judgment. Those who rejected that warning and said, I don't care, I'm going to take it anyway, they're experiencing the consequences of their conscious decision. 
That's what it's going to be at this point. People are going to experience what they want. They don't want anything to do with God. In verse 3, it says, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The second trumpet judgment, back in uh, chapter 8, verse 8, it says it affected a third of the salt water on the earth. This second bowl judgment destroyed all the rest, which will make the world uninhabitable. So we're doing, you know, real uplifting Sunday morning service, okay? <laughs> the world's going to be destroyed. It's going to make the world uninhabitable. The oceans are the earth's filtration system. To say they became blood as of a dead man, it's another way of saying that they're just filled with death. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11. It is blood that makes atonement for the soul, Leviticus says. So this would be a very symbolic way of displaying an end, having come upon the ability for salvation. And then verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water. They became blood. And the angel in the waters proclaimed, You are righteous, O God, the one who is, was, and who is to be, because you judge these things. They shed the blood of saints and prophets. You give them blood to drink. It's what they want. It's their due. So all fresh water gone compared to the third trumpet judgment that says a great star fell from heaven, a burning torch upon a third of the rivers and the springs of water. Here it's final. No more fresh water. I mean, imagine that. You pretty much got to buy bottled water these days. You don't drink what's coming out of the tap, you know, but... This would be like, you know, gold, diamonds, fancy car, luxury vacation. Who cares about that? Dude, I need a drink of water. Water will become the most valuable commodity upon the earth at this point. Now, I remember we lived in Southern California. There was a drought, very severe. You don't realize at first when you move to California from Wisconsin, you just think, you know, every place is green. Well, you see all these palm trees and you see all the lush gardens, huge hedges, beautiful lawns. You don't realize it's all irrigated. You know, it, it, all the water, Southern California comes from way up north in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It all comes in large trenches and down into pipes. And you realize in a drought, dude, we're living in a desert. That's what Southern California is. They had to start rationing water the late, 80s, early 90s, lawns and bushes, everything began to die. All of a sudden it began to turn brown. Water was extremely valuable all of a sudden. They had water cops who drove around and they would give you a ticket if you're watering your lawn. I was doing gardening, so of course it affected our home. But that's nothing. That's going to come upon the whole planet, just going to start to shrivel and die. And notice in verse 5, John says, And I heard the angel of the waters. So according to scripture, there is presently angelic oversight placed upon the natural resources of God's earth. Back in chapter 7, verse 1, John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the wind back, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. It's like God's miraculous creation. It's not just random as, you know, I was taught in my public school days. Its creation isn't random, nor is its regulation random. You look at how precise the temperature on this planet is. You see how precise, you know, the rain that moves around in this regulation. Not one sparrow falls to the ground, Jesus said, but your Heavenly Father knows it. you got every hair counted. You know, they're giving out Nobel Prizes this week. There was scientists. They got this big prize they discovered in the, in the midst of cells, these little gates that open and close, allowing certain proteins to come into cells. And they, all, they're, all they're, you know, finding out is what God invented and what God put in there. And they get a prize for it. <laughs> Here, the angel who would know, because he presides over the sea, over the water, he proclaims there... You know, you're righteous. The one who is, was, who is to be because you judge these things. God is righteous in judging the earth, is what he proclaims. That's what the Greek word for righteous means, that, that which conforms to what is right. Romans chapter 3 says of human beings, there is none right, no, not one. 
I hate to tell people, I hate to tell you, you're not righteous. Now, one person conforms to what is right according to God's perfect standard. Only Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, so that we can be made righteous. I can be made right in him before God. I can be conformed into what is right according to God's standards of right and wrong through trusting in Jesus Christ as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Here this angel who is the overseer of the earth's water that's just been trashed, he's declaring how God is right to do so. You are righteous, O God, the one who is, who was, who is to come. It's another way of saying you're able to view everything from an eternal perspective. For you see the end from the beginning. You're absolutely right proclaiming and judging these things, verse 5. You're right in bringing judgment in this specific way upon these specific elements in order to judge the remaining inhabitants of the planet because of four they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink and it is their due it's another way of saying that the judgment being poured out is fitting for them in other words it's not only that god is just and he is fair but his judgment is equal in proportion to the crime committed the Greek verb is what is called active tense because they have literally, there's no have in the, in the verse. It's just because they shed blood. Dude, that is what they did continually. As a continuous action, that is what they lived for. To shed the blood of anyone who serves God in this world and eliminate any convicting presence of God's Holy Spirit. That's who's going to be left on the earth. And due to that, it's only proper, dude, they, they're given blood to drink. You, you want blood, here you go. It's what they earned, and they demand their wages. In verse 7, I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord Jesus, uh, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Now, this declaration comes as an amen. So this angel pronounces, you know, you are right, and then an, an amen follows to this, uh, you know, proclamation by this angel. Now, you may have an asterisk in verse 7 in your Bible like I do. It tells me down at the bottom a clarification. The words another from are not in the original Greek in this verse. Adding the words another from the altar implies another angel is saying this, but that's not how it reads in the original language. It literally says, then I heard the altar saying, so it's making the physical altar speak. By attributing these words to the literal altar directly, this opens up a very interesting, important understanding. The altar there in the Old Testament system, when we're getting into this in the book of Exodus, we'll be getting in a few weeks as we're studying the whole Levitical system. The altar stood symbolically in front of the tabernacle and later on in front of the temple. And it was a type or symbol of the coming cross. I have to go to the cross before I can enter into God's presence. And it's what that altar represented. The, it was a type or symbol, the blood that was spilt on that altar and the fire that consumed the sacrifice. It all symbolized God's judgment of sin, prefiguring the propitiation, as it's called, the satisfying atonement that then the priest could enter into the tabernacle. Oh, it all symbolized what our Lord did for us on the cross before the Father for our sins. Here that symbol is personified, it's speaking for itself. Even so, because you, know, you, have, you have deemed these people rejected your gracious offer, God provided escape from these judgments through the cross in advance. And those who rejected their judgments are true and faithful to be fulfilled, is what it says there in verse 7. You are righteous in keeping your divine justice. This is right. In verse 8, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. Power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and didn't repent. So the fourth trumpet judgment, if you 
we're here in chapter 8, the, the fourth trumpet judgment affected the earth by destroying a third of its light source. Here with the fourth bold judgment, the same light source is increased to where people are scorched, it says. That which was given originally for humanity's comfort and our care with God regulating the proper distance of the sun and the amount of heat and everything that comes for that purpose. When that regulation is removed and God says, have at it, you run the earth by yourself, it becomes an instrument of punishment. No water, scorching heat, so of course people are going to cry out for mercy. Please, God, spare us. We're sorry. We didn't mean... But that's not the case. They blaspheme God. They blasphemed the name of God who had power over these things. You can imagine, I mean, it, you know, you can imagine the language that's going to be going forth from people's mouth. They're not going to repent. They're not going to give God glory. They refuse. The idea is they know who is doing this. They know who it is who has such power to allow them to incur a punishment, and yet they blaspheme his name. They express reproach against God. They hurl accusations against his honor, against him personally. His name refuse to repent, to turn from their sins, refuse to give glory to his name. And you read that and you say, oh, man, how sad. And I you know, remember, even... When I first got saved 30-some years ago and reading that, man, could people become that hard? I don't think that anymore. I see that in the news. You see, more and more people becoming like this, so hardened they hate God. Dude, 200 years ago or so, if someone said that they were an atheist, I don't believe there's any God, they'd be considered insane. I don't believe there's a God. Where are you from, man? I mean, that's, uh, and they, they would. They'd be considered crazy. Then more and more people became atheists. Oh, I just don't believe in God. Especially here in Madison, Wisconsin. Welcome to, you know, atheist capital. But see, now it's becoming more fashionable to just be, you know, hateful to God, to hate him and hate all that he represents here on this earth, and that is what you see people becoming more and more. You can't just walk around and, and you know, with a shirt on that talks about Jesus or something without people spitting at you or becoming angry. I mean, what's the problem? You got your, you know, gross shirt you're wearing. But see, that is the one principle of those who reject God, the one thing they hold on all the way to hell with. I am my own. Leave me alone. And God finally says, okay, you can have it. You can be alone. They're granted that. That will be the declaration of the whole world in the face of God's final judgment. Leave us alone. And the fifth angel, verse 10, poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. The throne of the beast, according to Revelation, the beast is who the Antichrist. He comes riding in on a white horse back in chapter 6. But the, by the middle of the tribulation period, he's called the beast. And he demands worship. And he's possessed by Satan himself. So this is the seed of his power. Judgment comes upon the ability of the Antichrist, this one world leader possessed by Satan. Judgment comes upon his ability to govern. He can't control anything. His kingdom becomes total darkness. Now it says in Exodus chapter 10 that God brought total darkness over the whole land of Egypt. Darkness that could be felt there was also darkness over all the earth for three hours at the Lord's crucifixion. This fifth bull, this judgment here, brings the same thing with the result being the people gnawed their tongues because of the pain and blasphemed the God of heaven, verse 11 says. This is like a preview of hell itself, which Jesus described as a place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That phrase, gnashing of teeth, it's the same as gnawing of the tongue. It's a description of perpetual anger and hatred and just scowling against the God they rejected, slanderously accusing him for the judgment they bring upon themselves. That's what's so ironic. 
They consciously reject God's grace, and then they hurl accusations against him for bringing what they, you know, what they asked for. They hurl accusations against him for the consequences. And there was this exhibit in an art gallery a while back. You might have seen as supposed modern art. Yeah, I don't really get it, but it was in the news as an interactive artwork is what they called it. It was this chair with a shotgun attached to it in order to experience the full impact of this work of art, as they called it, a person had to sit in a chair and you're staring at this rifle barrel and it was loaded and it was fixed with a timer to go off at some random time in the next hundred years. It could go off in five minutes, it could go off in 50 years, nobody knew. But the crazy thing was there was lines of people in this news story, people are waiting, you know, I want to try this to experience this new work of art in this art gallery, all knowing the gun could go off at point blank range at any moment. And they're interviewing people as they're exiting the exhibit, they're all sweating like, wow, dude, that was so exhilarating, what a rush. I think things people do, all getting their thrill by willingly subjecting themselves to self-destruction, possible self-destruction. That is going to be the final state of people here on this earth when God's judgment falls, but there's no exit. They just willingly submit to what they know is going to bring God's judgment, and then they blaspheme his name. It says they were blaspheming God for their pain and their sores, Plural, verse 11. It's the accumulative effect of these judgments. Each judgment compounds upon the last one, and yet people refuse to repent. They're so hardened in their sins. And verse 12 says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. The river Euphrates would be equivalent to the Mississippi being dried up. That's how big this river is. This is done so as to allow for a mass advancement of troops. God's done similar thing in the past. He parted the Red Sea, according to Exodus chapter 14, to allow the children of Israel to go through on dry ground. At the time of Joshua, the Jordan River, was stopped to allow the Jews to enter the promised land, Joshua chapter 3. The same thing is prophesied here is happening in the future, not to God's people, but so the way, it says in verse 12, of the kings from the east could be prepared. Now, throughout Scripture, kings from the east refers to rulers from Mesopotamia, Babylon is where the area is known throughout the Bible, modern-day Iraq like those who came to visit Jesus, Matthew 2, the three wise men, they were the kings from the east. These kings are like kings with armies. They come from eastern Iraq, Iran area, and they're going to receive supernatural event to be able to move their troops over to the land of Israel, which is where they end up. And this is where, you know, we're just going through Revelation verse by verse. We're studying Isaiah and other prophecies in the Old Testament. When, when you pull all these things together, this is where you see the things going on in the Middle East are not coincidental either. They're not random. The things that are going on with Israel and Iran and Russia and all these things are being put into place, all the pieces. If you study Bible prophecy, you see that we're living on the cusp of these things coming. And uh, along with it, we've been told what the societies of the world are going to be like. The things that you see in society, you think, I can't believe people live this way or they believe these things. It's all been prophesied in the Bible saying this is how people are going to be right before this time. It's all going to be pulled together in this Antichrist. There's going to be some guy that is going to rise to world power in the future. It's going to say, we got to once for all destroy Israel. They're trying right now, and, it, you know, even our government, unfortunately, is telling them, dude, you got to quit defending yourself. It's crazy. 
But why Israel? Why, you know, why aren't they all forming against, you know, Botswana or someplace like that? Because Israel is the focal point of where everything is heading. There's going to be a time where these armies are going to finally gather. All these armies will see more of this as we get further along. And we'll see more of it in the book of Isaiah and in the Old Testament prophetic books as well. But here, you know, this, this sixth bowl judgment, God is actually helping the enemies of Israel. We saw Friday, Isaiah chapter 28, it was like extra credit. If you want to see, Isaiah 28, 21 spoke of this and called it a strange work, an unusual act that God would work on behalf of Israel's enemies. And we developed that in that book, and it spoke more in depth, actually, about what we're reading here. How Israel's going to make a covenant with the Antichrist. They're going to make, you know, a contract with this world leader to finally, they think, it's going to bring some kind of peace. But it's going to seal their fate. And the Antichrist is going to turn against them, and he's going to get all the armies to once and for all bring a final destruction. And so it's not, but it's not just a physical battle. It says in verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits, so demonic spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That phrase, and I saw in verse 13, it introduces a digression, this series of bold judgments. It comes up to the sixth bold judgment, and now there's a digression for like two chapters. And again, if you are here following along, you can see this. There's a digression between the sixth and seventh seals being opened earlier in the book. There's a digression between the sixth and seventh trumpet judgments. And now there's a digression here, and it's going to go into chapter 17 and 18, explain, you know, this Babylonian system that God is judging. But I saw, and John says also, he sees a vision, a digression. Because when these armies are gathered together, if you turn ahead to chapter 19, verse 19, this is where the digression ends. And it says in chapter 19, verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, those who were gathered in their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And that's where it picks up again. So if you're you know, wondering, why well, does this you know, all of a sudden drop out? It's a digression that goes all the way to that verse, verse 19. This is the result. They're, they're going to find themselves fighting against the Lord as he comes back. These kings of the east, it says back in chapter 16 that they had these three frogs or unclean spirits, the, false, the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, Satan. Those three are removed. And so then it says back in verse 16 that I saw the three unclean spirits, verse 13, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, out of the mouth of the false prophet. This has been referred to as the unholy trinity that's going to be operating upon the earth in the second half of the tribulation period. They are the spiritual force that will be manipulating all physical events while God is judging the earth. It is seen in verse 14, and the spirits of demons performing signs will go out to the kings of the earth, so they're going to gather all these armies together. And there be passages, you know, is what lead many, you know, to believe that the Antichrist is going to have his headquarters there in that eastern Mesopotamian area, the, the Babylonian area, what is modern-day Iraq. The whole world is called to the battle all these earthly armies, the place they're called to, according to verse 16, they're gathered, they, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, many people obviously never study the Bible. They talk about the battle of Armageddon. But this place called in Hebrew Armageddon, the place is not the location of the battle. 
This is just where they gather all the armies, and we'll see that. Now, many battles have been fought in this location there in the Promised Land, but this is not a battle. The word Armageddon in Greek means the Hill of Megiddo. It's a large plateau. It overlooks the, this massive valley in the northern part of the Promised Land near the Sea of Galilee. If you've been to Israel, you've seen it. You stood on there, and you look, it's just beautiful. It was a main travel route. It linked Africa, Asia, Europe for millennia. It's a perfect place for organizing a huge military operation that's being described here. The destination for this coordinated military event is going to be in what we know today as southern Jordan is where they're going to march to. That's where the final remnant of Israel is going to flee to from Jerusalem. But this whole scenario is portrayed multiple scriptures as these armies come together. One in particular, if you turn to the Old Testament, to Psalm 2. About in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 2 describes this prophetically. Many other passages. We saw one of them, as I said, in Isaiah. And we'll see other passages in Isaiah prophesy of this. Psalm 2 is a God speaking. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Mashiach, his anointed, his Christ, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. This is all portraying, you know, this is 3,000 years ago, portraying, like I said, what we are on the cusp of seeing all come together. And the Lord looks upon it, the kings of the earth are gathering together. We're going to destroy God once and for all. Verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens is going to laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Look at this. They're going to beat me. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distresses them in his deep displeasure. Yet, or I have already set my king on my holy hill of Zion. It's a done deal. I will declare the decree. Now, the wording in the, the original language switches here. First is the father speaking. Now, here is the son. And this is uh, quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 as speaking of Jesus saying to the Father, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I will give you the nations for your inheritance, is what the Father had said to him, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Now, he's speaking to people of the earth. It's like the, the Trinity speaking. The Father speaks, the Son, now the Holy Spirit it's speaking to the people of earth. Be wise, be instructed, judges of the earth. Serve the Lord. Serve him with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son. In other words, make him your object of devotion. Jesus Christ, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. What an amazing prophetic psalm and offers God's perspective of this coordinated military invasion back in Revelation 16 as he turned back there. Right at the moment, you know, from God's perspective, it's a joke. Right at the moment that these armies of the earth are gathering together on an earthly level, I'm sure it's going to look very intimidating, <laughs> extremely. Again, as Isaiah 28, we saw on Friday, it says it will be a terror just to understand the report, to hear the news of this. But right at that moment, here in Revelation, there is interjected into this prophecy the words of the Lord himself there in verse 15. It's like the Lord interjects his words. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 
as is going to be seen in chapter 19, he is indeed coming, and he is the one that these armies are going to be wiped out by. But the Lord's return to the unbelieving, unaware world is going to be like a thief in the night, he's saying. They don't even understand it. It's going to be unexpected to these gathering armies. They're going to be expecting to come and eliminate Israel once for all. But this interjection by the one who's coming back, our Lord, his interjection into this passage, right at this point, is thought to be, just like in several other verses prior to this, it's like he interjects his words for the remnant of Israel that's still going to be here, that's going to be fleeing from Jerusalem from these uh, armies. It's for their encouragement. He puts in there, I mean, I understand what he's saying, but this is thought to be interjected for them in that day as they're fleeing from this gathering invasion. This is a command by the Lord to remain vigilant. Do not give up. So I can imagine in that day to see the things that are going to be coming upon the earth, to have those marching and gathering together. I can't even imagine today. Imagine living in Israel if you were Jewish. Dude, you're living in a place where people are bombing you. Everyone wants to destroy you. And the whole world from the UN to your quote-unquote allies are telling you to stop fighting back. When you talk to people who live there, you listen to interviews with people who are like, you know, they don't have anyone to turn to. They're getting more and more where they are, they are focusing on what their scriptures say regarding their Messiah coming, which they don't realize, you know, unsaved Jews don't realize he's come already. He's going to be coming back a second time. If you go to Israel, I've been there three times, it's secular. Most of the people aren't even religious. They don't even know what their own scriptures say, but they are growing in that ability now, and this is why God's allowing these things to cause them to have nowhere to turn. And this is going to be the ultimate end of that. Is what the tribulation period is not just to, you know, remove evil. It's not just to give people one more chance, but it is to break the will of Israel once and for all. They're going to cry out for their Messiah, and he's going to come back, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as they're processing all of this, here's his words. Because, you know, they're looking, they're going, wait a minute, God just opened up the Euphrates River for our enemies. What's going on? They're marching and gathering together for wiping us out. It would be very terrifying. But here the Lord encourages, I am coming soon. Behold, I am coming as a thief to those people. He encourages coming soon. Those who are waiting for him be watching expectantly. And they are commanded to keep themselves spiritually prepared. That's what it means to keep your garments. That's a biblical picture of righteousness. We're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Don't be found naked spiritually. Get your eyes on the Lord. And then again, speaking of these gathering armies, they gathered together in the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So in the midst of these bold judgments, the armies of the earth are gathering to coordinate their final assault on a remnant of God's people. No battle, no fighting is going to take place in that area. But it's at that point in verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a, a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. So the seventh bowl judgment, right at this point, is in the seven-year tribulation period, and God's wrath is coming, this is the definitive end. This seventh bowl judgment. It's 
portrayed by this loud voice, verse 17, coming out of the temple from the throne of God. So the voice of God declaring, it is done, is what he says there in verse 17. This is the end. All is fulfilled with regards to God's preparation of the earth for the Lord's return to establish his thousand-year reign. Now, as I said, there remains two chapters where it's going to be a digression and talk about what the world's going to be like when this final judgment comes, which is very interesting to see. Chapters 17 and 18 will provide detailed description of the judgment of Babylon, that which represent everything that opposed God from the Tower of Babel to, you know, the final world system. But these final verses, 17 through 21, are more or less a summary of the physical earthly cataclysms that are going to accompany the second coming of Jesus Christ. Such an earthquake, verse 18 says, of such magnitude that no other earthquake that strong has ever occurred since human beings have been on the earth. The way Isaiah portrays it in Isaiah 24, the whole earth is shaking like a drunken man, it says. That kind of an earthquake. Major rearranging of the earth's surface, just like at the time of the flood when that judgment happened, when Noah and his family stepped off of the ark, everything looked completely different. That is going to happen heading into the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a total rearranging. The great city, Jerusalem, divided into three parts, it says here. Other scriptures that speak about this point right here in the tribulation period, describe the city of Jerusalem being thrust up onto a high mountain. You can see that in Ezekiel chapter 40 and the following end chapters of Ezekiel. Isaiah chapter 2 talks about a high mountain where our Lord's throne is going to be during the kingdom age, that thousand-year reign. Other earthly cities are going to be leveled, verse 19 says. Islands, mountains are going to disappear all in preparation for the Lord's coming kingdom. And it's also at that point, great Babylon, it says in verse 19, is remembered to give her the full cup of judgment, wipes out all those who oppose God. Now, you know, if this was something that, wow, you know, that seems like a fantastic story and couldn't possibly happen. Again, you see the things leading up to this already being put into place today. And that's the things Jesus told us to look for in what's called the Olivet Discourse. As you see wars and rumors of wars growing, if you see pestilences, you see earthquakes, you see famines, and these types of things, you just watch the news someday. Look at how many places floods are taking place on the earth today. Look at the different diseases that are plaguing the earth and growing together. Jesus said that's just in preparation of the seven years. Before this comes, this is going to be God's judgment. Before that comes, he's going to take his church off of this earth. And so you want to make sure that you are a member of that church. It's such a significant event. You know, he's going to spend two chapters describing the destruction of Babylon. But the chapter here ends with, you know, God's going to send hail, 100-pound hailstones on people. They're left on there. They don't cry out for mercy. They're not going, oh, God, please have mercy. They blaspheme God. This is the state of the people who will be left here. They're going to play because the plague of hail was exceedingly great. Not great as in wonderful. You know, this is great. You know, but great as in enormous, an enormous plague of hail. You don't want to be here. If you're not saved, today is a day to get saved. Now, they had a great hurricane this week. His name was Milton. Again, not great as in wonderful, but great as in enormous. They were considering establishing a new category. We never seen one this big. Dude, let's make a category six. And the authorities were telling people, evacuate now or you're going to die. It's not, you know, you're going to be taking a chance or you know, may not make it. You will die if you remain in the path of this hurricane. That's why God provides scriptures like this. There is an end coming. What we live in right now is not heaven. It is not the final result. 
if I try to make it heaven, if I try to make earth, you know, everything that I want, all my pleasure, fill it with all of my, you know, desires and all those things, I am wasting my time. The Lord could come back this afternoon. And what if he did? Would you be ready or would you be on, you know, some kind of website trying to get your fulfillment out of something? If he came back tonight, would he be the object of your desire or would it be some earthly thing? I know so many believers, did, I mean, you talk to them, yeah, I'm a Christian. And you say, oh, well, you know, you look at them, especially at church, they wear Christian clothing, they go to Christian concerts, they know all the Christian artists. They read the latest Christian bestsellers, but they never have read this book. They don't even read the Bible. Ask yourself, how many times have I read this? Have I even read it? Do I read it? Do I study it? What if the Lord came back and found me, you know, with a joystick in my hand? It's like, what are you doing? Didn't you, you know, with my Bible, I know maybe he's not the most eloquent guy, but, you know, these are the things that are coming upon the earth very quickly very rapidly, right in our day. Am I getting the gospel to as many people as possible? Have I ever shared the gospel with anybody? Do I? Or am I simply living for this world? Now is not the time. Yeah, do we have an election coming up? It's going to be crazy. You think it's going to be peaceful? <laughs> no. Our nation has not been divided this bad since the Civil War. And what happens after the election day? I don't care what side wins. You know, but the other side is not going to go home quietly. And so, you know, I have to be prepared. I have to be ready and I have to be engaged in the things that are going on. But keeping my eyes on the Lord, for these things are coming to pass very quickly upon this earth. You got hurricanes. Yeah, we've had hurricanes forever, not this big. And they seem to be getting bigger. People are messing around with things they shouldn't be messing around with. And so, Lord, we pray that, God, we can keep our eyes on you and the things that we do, that, God, you would keep us strong by your power and by your strength, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you all the glory and come back quickly. Maybe today is the day, and that would be awesome. If it's not, then maybe tomorrow or the next day. Maybe not even in our lifetime. I don't know, but it's hard to imagine with the way the world is getting and with what you told us to watch for. So God, come quickly. And until that day, hold us up by your power and may we be a light and may we be, Lord, effective in each of our sphere of influence. And as we break into prayer right now and make that just a corporate time of praying together, may it be a powerful time. May we pray in one accord and fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ as of one body. We love you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you for giving us a heads up and telling us ahead of time what's to come. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to stand at the end of service. We have corporate prayer. So if you're visiting, uh, pray together. We're not like everybody in one group, but different groups. We're going to have a time of everybody praying in one accord in different groups.
the heart of the Father. I've never felt at home like this, just like a child, so innocent. Now I'm safe inside your arms, cause you won't let go. Give us that unity of your Holy Spirit within us that we pray in one accord. Lord, let us not be distracted by the things of this world, Lord, but let us pray for them. Let us pray for those that are suffering. Let us come alongside those. Lord, we pray that you would just help us to not be deceived as we continue to turn and look to you in all things. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's gather together and pray.